In Leviticus 23, there's a lot here. There's a lot here. He's talking about feasts, and it's like, what's the big deal with the feasts? Like, why would we have to take longer on the feasts? You do not need to turn to, to this other place. I'm going to read from Colossians chapter 2, beginning at verse 16. If you're taking notes, um, you can write this down. Levit or, so Colossians 2, 16. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths. Okay, let no one judge you. Don't let anybody put a trip on you over those things. He says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. So he gives us a little bit of info there, a little bit of insight into Leviticus 13. And the first part of what I just read in Colossians is the fact that there are some people who will try to put a trip on you over specific religious holidays, the way that you do things, you know, how dare you put a Christmas tree in your house because, you know, that's from Satan or whatever. I've heard lots of things over the years. Um, there, 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 is, there are actually people, Christians, who celebrate all of these feasts. Now, there are going to be seven feasts in total, and we'll work our way through those things. But there are people who, uh, Christians, who celebrate those feasts, even going so far as to sacrifice the animals that they're calling for. And that might sound strange to a lot of us, but to, to some Christians, it's not strange at all. What I've seen happen, and, I, and I've, I've known some of these people, um, what can often happen is they celebrate these seven Jewish feasts. They're Christians, but they celebrate these seven Jewish feasts. And oftentimes, they have an attitude, it, it kind of grows. Oftentimes, they get an attitude of, you know what, I celebrate the feasts. And because we're supposed to, you know, if we want to be godly, and you don't. So um, they, they have this, this idea or this thought that, they, uh, that you are less of a Christian, and they can make you feel that way. So it's important for you and I to understand what Paul wrote to, Col to the, the Colossians. So let no one judge you in food or in drink or regarding a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths. A lot of the, the festivals had to do with when the new moon started and, they would, it was coordinated that way. But he says, what, what, what Paul is saying is, listen, all of these feasts that we're reading about or that we're about to read about from Leviticus 23, he says, if you celebrate them, great. If you don't celebrate them, that's okay too. Because he goes on to say in verse 17, these things, he says, they are a shadow of things to come. A shadow. So the feasts that we're reading about in Leviticus 23 are a shadow of what was to come. He goes on to tell us, well, we go, well, what's the shadow from? What's, you know, what, what do you mean by shadow? He said, there are shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. In other words, the things that we're about to learn about in Leviticus 23, they are pointing us to Jesus. They are pictures of Jesus. He goes on to say in verse 18, let no one cheat you of your reward, taking delight in false humility and worship of angels, intruding into those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. A lot of times people that, Christians that celebrate these feasts, not all the time, but a lot of times, they'll have an idea of, man, I'm, I'm holy, or I'm, I'm holier or godlier than you are. Vainly puffed up, he said. He says, and not holding fast to the head, from whom all the body, nourished and knit together by joints and ligaments, grows with the increase that is from God. Therefore, if you died with Christ uh, from the basic principles of the world, why, as though living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? In other words, why are you going back and, and celebrating those feasts, which is not a problem, but why are you going back and you feel like you have to celebrate those or else you're sinful? Paul is telling the Colossians that's not true. Okay, You don't have to celebrate those feasts. You can if you want to. And here's what they'll oftentimes tell you. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle. In other words, their life becomes, you know, you, you know, don't, don't touch the evil things. Uh, don't taste the evil things. You know, don't handle the evil things. He says in verse 22 of Colossians 6, uh, 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 Colossians chapter 2, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. These things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, 
false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. In other words, you may decide that you want to celebrate all of the feasts, and that's great. That's wonderful. But if we don't want to celebrate the feasts, no one should put a trip on us. Like, oh, you don't celebrate the feast, you're not really a godly person. No. According to what we read here, that's not true at all. The point is Christ. We always want to make sure that we are focused, centered on Christ. Celebrating the feasts could be great. But as Paul points out, they're not going to help you in your battle against your sinful flesh. You know, Trying to overcome sin, the feasts are not going to do that for you. It's just a feast. It's a way to remember. Now, let's pick it up in Leviticus 23, verse 1. You thought we would never get there. Verse 1 says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. So this is a message to everybody in the children of Israel. Say to them, The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. That's a cool word. These are my feasts. Now we learn a couple of things real quick. The feasts. That's what we're talking about. That's what God wants to give to his people. The feasts. This is, it's a challenge to go through a chapter like this um, because there's so much information. And as I mentioned when I first started a couple minutes ago, that I, I've, I've got a challenge. And the challenge is this. The challenge is that it's now Sunday afternoon um, uh, on, a, on, a, on a spring forward uh, day. We've all lost an hour of sleep. And uh, on top of that... Uh, you guys are high school students, and not all of you come in here alert. Many of you stayed up too late last night watching YouTube videos, playing video games, hanging out, and you come in on Sunday morning, and you're like, man, I'm dead, um, and you know, just don't talk too loud, Chris, and that way I can get a snooze in. Um, that's, that's always a challenge, because there are many of it, you in here, maybe most of you, maybe all of you, I don't know. But, but many of you, you want to learn. Like, okay, let's go. I came here, you know, teach me something. You know, you, you, you got my hour and a half on a Sunday. Like, let's go, you know, preacher, tell me something. And so they're trying to strike the balance between the two. Between, again, not putting you to sleep, keeping you awake, giving you all of this info. There's way too much here. And we could actually, we could actually go through this chapter a couple of times and spend several weeks on it and pull out a lot. I can't do that. Uh, We'll get through part of it this morning, and then hopefully we'll, we'll finish up the rest of it next Sunday. But I, I can't take that long, uh, again, because um, you know, the, 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 the mind and the heart can only receive as much as the hind parts can last on those plastic chairs. And it's, you know, it's like, whoo, I'm, I'm ready to go to sleep. So we, I, I've got I've to keep it going at a pace, but there's so much info here. Now... Now, what about all these feasts? Again, what, what's, what's the deal? You know, why, why all the feasts? All of the feasts that we're talking about, seven of them, all point to Jesus. That's why we're taking our time to learn these things. Because they show us that God all along had a plan to send Jesus. And each of these feasts, they are going to show us a picture of, of a part of God's plan. Okay? So that's why we're taking our time to go through these things. So, verse 2, the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. What is convocations? Does anybody know what a convocation is? Anybody have a different translation there and it doesn't say convocations, it says something else? What's that? Festivals. Festivals, okay. That's a good one. Anybody else? Holy festivals, Okay. The word convocations means assemblies, okay? means assemblies. So as God starts to teach on the feasts, what he tells them here in verse 2 is, the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy assemblies. These are my feasts. So there's a key point here when it comes to these feasts. There were seven feasts throughout the Jewish calendar, the Jewish year. And the first thing that we learn about these feasts is that they're from the Lord. 
The second thing we learn about these feasts is that they are assemblies. That, that point is extremely important for, a, uh, for people living in the digital age, which is what you are living in. It is extremely important for those of us that are moving into the metaverse, into the virtual world, virtual reality world. It's extremely important that we understand this point. Here's the point here. As we start to learn about these assemblies, these convocations, is that God wanted these people seven times a year to gather in one place. Gather together bodily. Gather together in person. Gather together not through Zoom or FaceTime or through uh, 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 video, you know, messenger or any other way. But he wanted them to gather bodily together. Extremely important. And it's extremely important for you and I to understand this. And one of these days, hold on, this is a scary thought, but one of these days you are going to have kids of your own terrifying you look around these people next to you in front of you behind you one of these days will be parents perish the thought you will be parents and your kids will be raised in a the virtual world it's going to be i mean it's already so much of our life so much of your lifestyle is all about video and it's just going to continue it's not going to become less virtual reality it's just going to become more and more and more and more, and more. Uh, we see it already in the church uh, when we were when we shut down for a little while for COVID, a couple years ago i guess that was now it goes so quick uh, what we did in here is Matt and I continued to show up, and we were doing uh, worship and studies over Instagram Live. Uh, really, it was very convenient, you know. Uh, you set up the, your phone, hit the button, boom, there you are, you're live. Let's go. And um, we come in. We would come in here. We have pictures. Come in here. The room's all dark. There's nobody in here. It's just Matt and I, and uh, it was so lonely. Um, but, but we, you know, we'd come in here and, and then what happened was after we started meeting again in person, when our pastor said, okay, we're going to open up the church. Let's go. Let's, let's get it. So we started meeting again. We had some people that said, Hey, uh, are you going to continue to do Instagram live? And my answer was absolutely not. No, no, we're not doing that. Why? Because what happens is people go, well, you know what? Uh, Man, I'll just, I don't really feel like putting my clothes on. Uh, you know, I'm kind of tired. And so uh, I'll just I'll just stay home. I can watch church in my chonies and, you know, nobody will even know. And, you know, not a big deal. And, and they, can just, they can just stay home. Uh, we see that in, in, in the church in a large part. We, we've, got a, we've got a live feed for the main sanctuary. And there are lots and lots and lots of people who do not come to church. Now, in many cases, it's a good thing because we have people, there are actually people from all over the world that watch our services. Can you believe that? Most of you are like, why? It's so boring, <laughs> right? There are people who, who watch our services from all over the world. There are also people who watch online the live feed who cannot leave their home. They are physically unable to do so. They're shut in. To their own home and they can't get out in those cases that live feed is life-saving it's an umbilical cord man that's a it's a source of life but for far too many people it has become the habit well, it's easy I don't have to go back to church with all those germy people and I can sit at home sip my coffee if I wake up late because you know my old-school alarm clock didn't go off on the spring forward day then, you know, oh, not a big deal. I'll just stay home today and, you know, drink my coffee and it's not a big deal. And what happens is that becomes habit. Now, there's a problem with that. The problem is, is this. The problem is, how can I assemble if I'm not there? In Hebrews chapter 10, 
the writer of Hebrews said, let us hold fast, that means hold hard, the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another to, in order to stir up love and good works. Some translations may say spur. To spur up love and good works. Verse 25, Hebrews chapter 10. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. So the writer to Hebrews said, don't stop assembling. Some people get in the habit of doing that. Now let me ask you something, Fusion High School. Let me ask you something. I know it's Sunday, man. Sunday afternoon is lunchtime. Like, let's go. But let me ask you a question. What we are doing right here, right now, is assembling. Tell me this. Why is this a good thing? Why is it good that we're assembling? Anybody? What do you think, Chris? Bam! Okay. It's a good one. That wasn't mentioned in the first service because they're so wicked. Okay? <laughs> That's a good one. I'm just kidding. Is anybody still in here from first? Sometimes people repeat. Um, I was just kidding. Um, but, 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 okay, there's a real good one because where two or more are gathered... God says, there I will be in your midst. Okay, what else? Why is this a good thing that, we're, that we assemble? What do you think? In fellowship with other Christians. Fellowship with other Christians, Melissa says. What is fellowship with other Christians? What, what do you mean by that? Just like you hang out and you get different viewpoints. Ah, yes. Hang out, get different viewpoints about what? About COVID, about, uh, uh, you know, the war, about what, what do we get different viewpoints about? Anybody know? Anybody? Anybody? What do you think? Christ. Okay, good. Yep, yeah, Christ. Any other thoughts? Yes, Joey. The Bible. How, how the okay? How the Bible's interpreted? Okay, good. Yeah, and 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 how it's applied? Okay, good. Anything else? What do you think? You get different viewpoints on anything in, in the world that's going on. Good, Randy. It's good to see you, by the way. I haven't seen you in a while. And uh, every time I drive by, man, it's like, <laughs> where's his mom? I'm gonna stay out of her way. You know, I cut his mom off one time. It's bad, bad news. I didn't know. I didn't know it was her. I just saw Randy, and I was like, I'm not letting him. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't know they were going to do But anyhow, um, yeah, we get all different viewpoints about, about world events, about the Bible, about Jesus, about lots of things. Okay? Anything else? Anything else? What do you think? In the back, yes. Bam. Yes. Community. Community. Did you hear the, key, key, the, the, the key word, community? Okay? Living together, okay? That's what we're doing here, yeah? That's what we're doing. We get together. Uh, we do things like we worship together, we pray together. But, um, you know, maybe we get together. Maybe you've been having trouble um, with that, you know, that fifth period teacher. Maybe she's just cray-cray. She's out of her mind. Like, I don't, I don't know why she gave me an F. Like, she actually expects me to turn in assignments. Like, I don't know what she's thinking, you know? Uh, you know, maybe maybe you got senioritis already. Like, man, doesn't doesn't he know I'm a I'm a senior? I don't have to do that stuff, you know. But what happens is you get together, you share that with somebody else in this room, and then they're like, "Hey, dude, you got to turn in assignments." And you're like, "What? Really? Yeah, come on. Doesn't matter. You're, you know, whatever. You what happens is we we get to connect, communicate, talk about issues and problems." You can tell, tell somebody else, yeah, I'm struggling, man. I'm really struggling. You know, uh, my, uh, you know, these, these, uh, you know, this guy, this guy at school keeps offering me drugs, or you know, there's this this girl on my team, and you know, she keeps, uh, you know, uh, 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 doing something, you know, treating me this way or whatever. And you can talk to uh, uh, to to the other Christians about those things. You can help one another. You can pray for one another. So those are some of the valuable reasons or the reasons why what we're doing right now is valuable. Because we, we, get, we get that community. We get to, to, to encourage one another, challenge one another, maybe even correct one another. When, when the writer to Hebrews said, and let us consider one another in order to stir up, 
the, the, um, some translations will say spur one another on toward love and good works. Randy, what do you do with spurs? There's a lot of different things you can do. Okay, basically, you get, you get on the horse with some spurs? Okay, okay. By doing what? By rubbing them with the spurs? No. What do you do with them? Kick them. <laughs> yes. Kick them in the ribs, man. And oh, they get going. And sometimes I need people to kick me in the ribs. Sometimes I'm lagging, man, as a Christian. Sometimes I'm, you know, just thinking in the flesh and thinking like a person and just like, ah, oh, you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to get in a bad attitude about different things. And sometimes I need for the Lord, but sometimes I need some of you. Sometimes I need my brothers or my sisters to kick me in the ribs, spur one another on toward love and good works. Because sometimes I'm thinking all about myself. Do any of you ever need a kick from the Lord? Like, yeah, Lord, I just, yes. Like, just kick me in the ribs, man. I need to get going. We cannot do that if I'm on the other side of the screen. And I'm just sitting in my house in my chonies with my coffee watching service. All I'm doing is taking. I'm not giving. There's, there's no community. So what we're doing here this morning for many of us, there, there may be some of us in here who are like, well, you know what? Uh, it's boring in here. I really don't care. And I'm just in here because it's a little bit less boring than the sanctuary. And plus, I can't sleep in there, you know, the ushers or whatever. But, you know, I can sleep. Whatever. You might be thinking, like, you know, this is not really a big deal. It's just, you know, it's just church. We do this all the time. Many of you have grown up doing this. It's just what you do. It's Sunday. It's Wednesday. We just, we just do it. But what we are doing has actually been ordained or set up by God. This is what God wants for us to be doing. Gathering. The reason I took so long to talk to you about that is because you guys, again, are growing up in this digital age. And all it's going to do is become more and more of the norm. Virtual classes. You're going to go, uh, take off for college. Some of you are going to take off for college. In the next two years, three years, four years, whatever, you're going to be going to college, and you're going to have the option. Do you want to go to in-person classes or virtual? That's a no-brainer. Why in the world would I want to go to school? Just give it to me on my screen. I was backstage on Wednesday night, and uh, I won't say who it is, because you know who it is. Or you might know who it is. Uh, but somebody had backstage... I was getting ready to go up on the stage to go teach. And they had their laptop open on the back counter. And it was this guy, it was teaching some kind of math. I, I, I was looking at the screen like, man, what? I don't even know what that is. It's like, it looked like hieroglyphics to me. I don't know what it was. Uh, I, I, I didn't get past Algebra 2. But I was looking like, man, I don't even know what this is. But the teacher's teaching. And I'm looking like, I kind of looked down the hallway like, why is this laptop just open? The person that left the laptop there was in class. Except they weren't in class. As far as the teacher knew, the professor, he could see that they had their screen on, but the person that was in class was gone doing something else. But that's going to become more and more the norm. And it's like, well, why would I go to class? I actually have to show up. If I take, if I take a... a, a online class, I just open up my screen, man, I can go to the bathroom, go play with the dog, uh, go get ice cream or coffee with my friends, come back later, turn the thing off, not a big deal. That's going to become more and more of the norm, and you are going to have kids that are going to grow up with that. Elementary, junior high, high school. I was telling somebody that night when I saw the screen, I was actually Pastor Aaron, I was telling him, he, that wasn't his computer by the way, but I told Pastor Aaron, I said, man, it's a good thing that there were no virtual classes when I was in, when I was in school. I, I hated going to school. And had you given me the option to just watch on a screen, psh, let's do it. And I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have to do anything. And uh, I would have been even dumber than I am now. So the, 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 that's going to become the norm. And it is important that you and I understand you may take college classes that are virtual, whatever, that's, that's up to you. But as far as church, we always want to make that the priority. No, I need to be there. Because if all I'm doing is listening online, all I'm doing is taking, I'm not giving. 
want to be there so that I can spur you on. And I want you to be here so that you can spur me on, kick me in the ribs when I need to. Now, all of that, all of that, and look at verse 2 one more time. The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy assemblies, these are my feasts. He wanted his people to gather. Verse 3, six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest. And some of you are like, amen. I like a, I like a holy rest, a solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. You like that part? No work. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Now, it's funny. God said we're going to talk about the feasts. And then the first thing he does is he doesn't talk about a feast. He talks about the Sabbath. The Sabbath was one day a week. It was Saturday. It was Friday night at sundown until Saturday, all day Saturday. That was their Sabbath. Okay? And he actually begins with that. Why? Well, it's not a feast, not officially, but it is like a weekly feast for the Jews. A weekly assembly or gathering or convocation. It's a holy day. But we will find throughout the Bible that the Sabbath, like the week and the Sabbath, that that becomes like a measuring rod. I'll point that out as we go on. Let me explain this to you. Um, there, are, there are seven feasts altogether. The first four feasts are a group together. The last three, obviously, are the second group. And as you can figure out, there's a separation of time in between the two groups. Why is that important? I'm glad you asked. Because as I said before, all of these feasts point to different events in God's plan. Okay, They're going to show us more than just the feast. There's something else that God is telling his people there. It's kind of like, you know, a little secret, you know, hidden clues in there. Okay? The first four feasts, which we're about to start here in just a minute, those point or relate to the work of Jesus in his first coming, his earthly ministry. So as we look at these, we'll see, oh, okay, this is, this is what God was pointing to. Verse 4, this is where, for those of you that take notes, we're going to look at first the Passover. These are the feasts of the Lord, verse 4, holy assemblies which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. They have set times. Verse 5, on the 14th day of the first month, the first month was called Nisan. Everybody say Nisan. Okay? This is different from what you drove today to, to a church, okay? This is missing an S. Nisan. Not Nisan, but Nisan. Okay? Nisan was the first month. He says, on the 14th day of the first month at twilight. Okay? Twilight. Team Edward? Anybody? No? Okay. Twilight in the, is the Lord's Passover. Okay? So, 14th day of Nisan at twilight, gives them a specific time, is the Passover. Now, who can tell us something about the Passover? Anybody remember anything about the Passover? Anybody? Anybody remember anything? Yes? Excellent. That is the main point of the Passover. They had blood on the door so that death would pass over your house and you would be saved. Okay? Pretty incredible story. The Passover involved something. Does anybody remember what it involved? And in fact, I'll go ahead and give you... Yes? A lamb without blemish. A lamb without blemish. Thank you very much, Nathan. A lamb without blemish. And what were they supposed to do with that lamb? Does anybody remember... What they were supposed to do with it before the Passover meal? What were they supposed to do with it? Do you know? Supposed to kill it and then uh, okay. spray its blood from the doorway. Yes. So they were to kill that lamb, take the blood, and put it on around their door. And then death was coming through and would see the blood and realize that this person trusted God. They listened. They followed God's instructions. And they would then pass over the house. Nobody in the house would die. Okay? But it involved the killing of a perfect lamb, Nathan said. Now, that perfect lamb, what do you think? 
represents Jesus. Represents Jesus. Yes. Okay. So the Passover feast was showing what Jesus was going to do. Now, imagine yourself a Jew way back then, thousands of years ago, and you're celebrating this feast. You got to take a perfect lamb, and you got to slaughter it. You take the blood, and you're now now you're now you're covered. Your family is covered in the blood. And that's a picture. Now you know, I'm looking into the future, and I know that Jesus is going to send a sacrificial lamb to spill his blood, sacrifice, and I'm going to be covered in the blood. Get it? That's Jesus. Okay? The Passover was meant to commemorate Israel's deliverance from Egypt. And with the sacrifice of the lamb for each family, show how the blood of the lamb averted the judgment of God for each Israelite family. The Feast of Passover clearly, obviously, presents Jesus as our Passover. You may remember that from 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We did that on Wednesday nights a long time ago. The Lamb of God who was sacrificed and whose blood was received and applied so the wrath of God would pass over us. So, the first feast the first of the seven feasts begins with the, the uh, sacrifice of Jesus in order to save us. So it wasn't just a feast to remind them that they had been rescued from Egypt. It was also not only commemorating the past, but pointing to the future also, God bridging that gap. Okay? We move on immediately in verse 6 to the second of these seven uh, feasts. The second one is this in verse 6. And on the 15th day of the same month. Now, what was the name of the month? It was what? Nisan. Nisan. Okay. And that happened, the Passover happened in Nisan on what day of the month? The 14th. Now we find out in verse 6 that on the 15th day of the same month, so this is the day after, is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat tortillas, chapati, unleavened bread, flat bread. You had to eat, you know, pita pockets or whatever. You know, you could not eat bread with yeast in it or leaven. Okay? Does anybody remember? So, so you had you had the the one night you had uh, the Passover meal and you had to eat it standing up. You had to eat it fully dressed. Uh, you had to eat it with your staff in your hand. In other words, you're ready to go. You're getting ready to take off because you're getting ready to leave Egypt. And this is your meal. Then the next day, he gives them a, a new festival. And that one is called Unleavened Bread. Does anybody remember anything about the Unleavened Bread? The Feast of Unleavened Bread? Anybody remember anything about that? It didn't fall out of the sky. No, that was manna. Yeah, manna. In San Bernardino, there's a place called Manna Donuts. Heavenly. Ezekiel, godly donuts. <laughs> Anyways, um, unleavened bread. What do you think? Did they have to take out like all the leaven? Yes, Elijah. So I'll, I'll take out all of the leaven from what? From their house. Yeah, leaven is what you put into bread, and it makes the bread rise. It's actually like a little piece of rotten bread. Is basically what it is, and it makes the rest of the bread rise. You get that you know nice squishy loaf, right? This is flat bread. Okay? It, it, it's not risen. Why did they want to take out all the leaven from the house? Why did they want to remove all the leaven? He's going to go on to tell us for seven days. Why, why did they want to take the leaven out? Yes? The leaven represented sin. Yes, the leaven represented sin. So God is showing them that they need to get the leaven out. They need to get the sin out. Okay? The, the, uh, they needed to be pure. And the Jews actually turned it into a fun thing where uh, they would actually, they would, they would have this whole thing where the mom would go through the house looking for leaven. And uh, wait, was it the mom or the dad? Somebody help me out. Anybody remember? You guys don't remember. Um, there would be one person from the family that would go and look for leaven throughout the entire house. So it was like a game. Everybody had to go through the house and they would have to, you know, uh, remove all the leaven. But it became this thing where they would actually leave a little piece and, you know, um, I'm trying to remember now. I cannot remember if it was the mom or the dad, but one of them would go through the house looking for that little piece of leaven, you know, and they would hide it somewhere, and it was like this whole game. And then they would, they would start their feast. But seven days, okay? 
Seven days. They would eat flat bread. Now, I like, I like flat bread. I like tortillas. Yes? Who likes tortillas? Right? You can do anything with a tortilla, man. You could just, just warm it up, put butter. You can, uh, yeah, yeah, just some butter. Uh, you could put, like, a... Uh, Put, make that thing into a hot dog, you know what I mean? Or you can, uh, I mean, just take stuff, just take stuff and throw it in there, man. Roll that thing up and just start eating. Get a California burrito, right? Beans and cheese and what, and then French fries. Just go, okay? Chapati. Anybody eat chapati? Anybody like chapati? Anybody know what chapati is? Chapati. Uh, Indian cuisine, Indian food, it's their tortilla. They stole it from us. It's called chapati, okay? Chapati. And it's basically, you look at it and it's like, this is not a chapati, this, this, this is a tortilla. They, they try to tell me, no, it's chapati. Okay, whatever. Okay, it's tortilla. But it, it's, it, yeah, round round chapati, and basically the same thing. You know, you put your uh, uh, your dal or your, uh, um, uh, what, what's the other stuff they eat? Uh, uh, I can't remember. What, but anyways, you use that. It's just basically like a tortilla. I like that kind of thing. Okay? Breads. They had to eat unleavened bread for seven days. Now, the Feast of Unleavened Bread was a week-long celebration the week immediately following Passover, the feast showed the purity Israel was to walk in, illustrated by eating only bread without leaven, which was a type of sin, like Melissa said, after the blood deliverance of the Passover. The Feast of Unleavened Bread relates to the time of Jesus' burial after his perfect, sinless sacrifice on the cross during which he was received by God the Father as holy and complete. In Acts chapter 2 verse 27 called him the Holy One who would see no corruption perfectly accomplishing our salvation. So that's what that feast was supposed to do was to point to that. Verse 7. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. What is a convocation? Assembly, yes. You were to have this assembly. You shall, this is my favorite part, you shall do no customary work on it. I like what God's doing here. Listen, you need to eat and you need to not work. Those are two of my favorite things. He says in verse 8, But you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy meeting, once again an assembly. You shall do no customary work on it. Now, in case you haven't picked up on it yet, we're about to start the next feast here, the third one, which is called the Feast of First Fruits, and that's as far as we'll get today. But, but before, if you haven't picked up on it yet, these feasts involve assembling with one another, which is always fun, getting together, hanging out with your friends, visiting, and eating. These are good things. I point that out because there are some in our world who think church, why would you go there? You could do anything else and you choose to go to church on a Sunday or on a Wednesday. There were those of you that when we had our home Bible study, some of you used to go on Fridays also. It's like, why would you do that? Boring, right? But understand that God wants for his people to assemble he wants them to be celebrating. He wants them to be eating. He wants them, hey, don't do any work. Just relax. I want you to talk with one another, fellowship with one another. It's not for making money. It's just for hanging out, remembering God. These are good things. Now, beginning at verse 9, we get the Feast of First Fruits. Those of you that come on Wednesday nights, uh, this coming Wednesday night, you'll hear a little bit about this. Verse 9, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land, Okay, so he's already preparing them for when they get to the land that they're going to. When you come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest, then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. A sheaf. Anybody know what a sheaf is? Sheaf? Anybody? Is it like a what? Something that you put your knife into? What do you think? It's a what? Sheaf. This is a sheaf. Sheaf. Yeah. 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 Sheaf. But know what a sheaf is? No. <laughs> you obviously don't. 
But what do you know? <laughs> Joseph. Oh. 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 I could do that with Joey. Joey hasn't been here in a while either. First day back, cut him down, man. Chop. Who else? Somebody else answer the question. I'll chop him down. What's a sheaf? Sheaf is a, a group. Of, it's a bunch of wheat. Okay. How many of you knew that? Some of you. I said sheaf, and some of you were like, Yeah, of course. A sheaf. They had to bring a sheaf of the first fruits of the harvest to the priest. Okay? He would then, in verse 11, you shall wave the sheaf around before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the day following Passover's Sabbath was a time to give the first fruits of the harvest to God. The idea was to dedicate the first ripened stalks of grain to God in anticipa anticipation of a greater harvest to come. He says in verse 12, And you shall offer on that day when you wave the sheaf a male lamb of the first year, which reminds us of what? Suarez? He's like, uh, that's always the right answer. By the way, if you ever get caught falling asleep in, ch in church and the pastor asks you, like, hey, what, do you, what does that mean? Or, you know, what, what do you think? You just go, Jesus. Okay? It'll always work. Um, you shall offer that day when you have waved the sheep a male lamb of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. So it involved this male lamb. Its grain offering shall be two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to the Lord for a sweet aroma. And its drink offering shall be of wine, one-fourth of a hen. You shall eat neither bread, nor parched grain, nor fresh grain, until the same day that you have brought an offering to your God. It will be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. Can you imagine how hard? To the guys, that would be so hard. You can't eat any bread at a time. I've seen you guys. I have a son. Like, you can just, you'll eat a whole loaf of bread. And, and you, you'll just, you'll toast the whole thing. You'll just toast like two pieces of it. Maybe you have one of those ones with four. You'll just toast it. Some of you do, Some of you are looking at me and smiling because you know you do that. And then you get home and your mom's like, hey, where's the bread? I'm hungry. Why didn't you make some mac and cheese? That's too hard. Yes. Yeah, it's just easy to just toast. Just eat the whole loaf, man. My son would do that. I'm like, dude, what? where's the bread? What? Like, just seriously, you couldn't, like, warm, you couldn't warm up some leftovers? No. Toast. Right? I saw the other day my daughter and I, I didn't see it, I'm sorry. I've seen it before, but my daughter and I were talking about, um, there's, some of you may have seen this. There's a brand of bread, it's been around for a long time, called Bimbo. Bimbo. Yeah. yeah. They have pre-toasted bread. You can buy pre-toasted bread. In a pack, you open the package up, there's toast in there. Now, I have to, this is a weird little thing about me. I'll share this with you. You guys want to know? I'll tell you anyways. Okay? I actually like to make toast. Once I don't have a lot of toast, but once in a while I'll make toast. And then I'll actually, it's a little secret thing. I'll actually let the toast cool. Okay? And then, what's that? That's the point. You spread the butter on and it's just... Mm. Get all of the butter. You know, if you put the butter on when it's hot, then it just soaks into the bread, and you have a floppy piece of bread. You know? So really? Okay. I like the I like the little bit of crunch, and I like all that butter on there, man. Okay. Anyways, yeah, they, they, they make this. They make this. You can buy bread that's pre-toasted. And my daughter was like, "Oh yeah, they, you know, we saw it at Costco or something. I don't remember where they saw it." I was like, "What? Like?" How lazy can you be? <laughs> and then and then I thought about my son. I was like, oh, that'd be perfect for him. He'd be like, oh, what? I don't even have to toast it? You know, oh, yeah, put some butter, man. Just eat, it, eat the thing. Uh, but, but anyhow, um, uh, they weren't allowed to eat uh, uh, bread or parched grain until they brought this, uh, this offering. And then they could. But here's the thing, as we finish. The Feast of First Fruits relates to the resurrection of Jesus. So, what was the first one? The first one was the Feast of uh, Passover. That showed us the death of Jesus. Then there was the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which pointed to the time uh, uh, after Jesus' crucifixion. And now we have, thirdly, 
this feast of first fruits is pointing to the resurrection of Jesus, who was the first, I'm going to ask you a trick question, who was the first, in fact, I'm going to ask you a trick question, and whoever gets it right, I will give you a brand new pair of active socks. Who wants a brand new pair of active socks? Anyone? Okay. I'm, are they 20 bucks? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I stole them, so I don't know what they cost. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You're like, yeah, you're Mexican, you stole them. I know my people. Come on. <laughs> I did not steal these, okay? I didn't steal the socks. The fe- I know. The Feast of First Fruits. Uh, the Feast of first, first Fruits relates to the resurrection of Jesus. Here's the question. He, Jesus, was the first human to receive resurrection. Yes or no, and I'm going to ask you to explain. Joey? I'm pretty sure it was no, it was like Lazarus. That's a really good guess. And uh, that's not correct, but that is, that is, that is a very good guess. And that's where I would have gone too. In fact, you probably heard me say that, that Lazarus was resurrected. Okay, I think I saw Chris's hand first. Wasn't it the little girl of the, the one dude? Like, the, remember the lady touched his dress and then he was late to the little girl? Who yeah. Died and I think we just talked about that, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. yeah I think so. Uh, however, n- no. Oh, what? No. I told you, trick question, man. I don't just give away socks for free. Okay? Is it like an average because of, like, dress or resurrection? Um, n- No. No, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't uh, uh, Adam or Eve. Uh, but you, you got you got kind of you didn't get close, but you're, you were kind of thinking in the right direction. Anybody else want to? Was was Jesus the first one to be resurrected? I know yeah. it is. You say yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do you think it was Jesus? I don't know. You said the answer. I think it's Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> But I need an explanation. <laughs> now, you are absolutely right that Lazarus Lazarus was resurrected, right? And so was um, the, the little girl. Remember, we just talked about that. He, he grabbed her and said, Talita kum, and, and picked the little girl. I say to you, arise. Picked her up. She came back to life. There were others, actually. So, so how could Jesus be the first one that resurrected if these other people resurrected? Trick question, man. What do you think? The veil. Oh man, that's so close. There's a difference there that we're missing, but that is so close. Zach, can you kind of like, yeah, maybe? Okay, what do you think? Yes. Uh, you know what? Actually, you, you are not wrong. And you may just end up with a pair of socks. We're going to take one more here. Let's see. Enoch. Okay. Uh, no. <laughs> good, good guess, but no. <laughs> I'm just pulling out random names. <laughs> <laughs> Methuselah. Okay. Now, she was the closest, so I'm going to give you the socks after, okay? So, But here, here's the difference. Here's the big difference. Other people were resurrected before Jesus was. Here's the big difference. The difference is, those individuals were resurrected in the same body, and they had to die again. Jesus was resurrected with a glorified body. So when it says in the Bible that he was the first fruits, and again, we'll talk about this some more on Wednesday night, Jesus is the first fruits, that he was the first one to to be resurrected, we all go, no, he wasn't. And I used to think the same thing, like, uh, no, it wasn't. There were other people that were resurrected. I don't understand. That's the difference, is that Jesus was resurrected with a glorified body. Remember, you might remember that he would actually, he came back from the dead and he actually walked through walls. He showed up and, oh, you know, what is this guy? You know, who's, who's this? You know, he walked through, because his body had been glorified. Everybody else, like Lazarus, raised from the dead, but in the same body, which meant Lazarus had to die again. Isn't that a bummer? Yeah. Like, man. I already died once. I got to do this again. It's like having to retake a test that you didn't like the first time. You take a test and then like you didn't do well. Like oh, I got to take this thing again. 
Lazarus had to die twice. What a bummer. So he goes on to say this. The Feast of First Fruits relates to the resurrection of Jesus, who was the first human to receive resurrection. He is the firstborn from the dead. Colossians 1.18 says that. And has become the first fruits. This is what we'll get to this Wednesday night, 1 Corinthians 15. He, uh, he has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Now, when he says asleep, he means those that have died, those that are the Christians that have died. He says, Jesus is the first fruits. Christ, the first fruits. Afterwards, those who are Christ's at his coming. I'm going to read that one more time. Listen, if you're just waking up, he says this. He has become, Jesus has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, those that have died. Christ, the first fruits. Afterwards, those who are Christ's at his coming. What he's saying there is, and this is where we'll end, he's saying that Jesus, the feast of first fruits, points to Jesus being the first one to be resurrected in a glorified body. No one had ever done that before. But here's the deal. Remember the sheaf? Is that thing that you put your knife into? No, I'm just kidding. The sheaf. What was the sheaf again? Does anybody remember? <clears throat> yes, it was a group of wheat. And you brought that, and the priest would wave it and you know do the different things. But what did that first sheaf, what did it symbolize for them, for the people back then? Not Jesus, but what did it symbolize? That there was more to come. I'm giving you, Lord, I'm giving you the first sheaf, and I know that there's more to come. Okay? Now let's talk about Jesus for a minute before we close. We've got we to get you out of here real quick here. If Jesus is our first fruits, he's that, so to speak, he's like the sheaf. He was, and the point is that he was resurrected in a glorified body. If he's the first fruits, then who would be the more to come? Who else would be resurrected in a godly body? God, godly body? Bodily, <laughs> in, a, in a bodily form. <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a glorified body. <laughs> a godly bodily. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, translate. I, I, was, I, was, I was speaking in tongues. Uh, so, so if Jesus is the first fruits who will be resurrected in bodily form in a glorified body, then who's, who are the others, if he's the first, who are the others that are going to be resurrected in bodily form? Christians. All that to say that you and I, we have the hope of life after death. That's the whole point. And you might be going, what? like we already knew that. This is church. We already knew that. But there are a lot of people who don't know that, whose only hope is this world. Do you know that church attendance has gone up over the last couple of weeks? And does anybody know why? Gas prices. <laughs> <laughs> Lord, just bring the gas prices in. What do you think? Crisis going on where? Crisis going on where? Russia and the Iranians, right? No, not the Iranians, the Ukrainians, right? Ukraine, okay? <laughs> Russia and Ukraine. And that strikes fear in the heart of people, and then people start to show up for church. Why? Because they're looking for some hope, and they know they can find it here. And so we might think, well, everybody knows you. We, 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 uh, you know, it's life after death, and we're going to resurrect, and all those different things. And that's Paul's. The whole point. On, uh, I'm giving it, giving it away here. If you come on Wednesday night, we started First Corinthians 15 already. We're going to finish this Wednesday. But the whole point in that chapter is Paul is telling the church. You will resurrect bodily in a glorified body. Because the Corinthians, there were people in Corinth, in the Corinthian church, who were saying, there's no resurrection. We're not, you know, we're not, we're not going to resurrect. And Paul says, no, we will resurrect. In bodily form, we'll resurrect. And so it's important that you and I know that. But it may be that you're here this morning. Maybe, I mean, here you are, you're at church. Maybe you go to church. That's what you guys do on Sunday, your family. And it may be that, you know, you listen to Christian music, 
and you go to church, listen to Christian music, and it might be that uh, you know you you um, you know you 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 come a couple times a week or whatever. Maybe you do Christian things. Okay. But my question for you this morning, as we close, is that's great that you do Christian things. Listen to Christian music. Go to church. Hang out with Christians. Maybe your family's Christian, and you hang out with Christian family members. That's great. What about you? Are you a Christian? Or, or are you doing Christian things, but you're not actually a Christian? Are you? Are you God's? Do you? Do you? In other words, are you God's property? Does God own your heart? That's the question. That's the question. Because doing these feasts. That's fine. But what we read at the beginning, what did Paul say in Colossians? He said, um, he said, these things are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. You see, he was saying that to the people that were just going through the motions, man. They were celebrating the feast. They were doing the stuff, doing the Christian things. But they didn't have Christ. They were missing Christ. And you want to make sure that you're not coming to church, but you don't have Christ. If you're not a Christian, why even come to church? What good will that do you? You don't want to come here, spend all your, your time here, suffer through these you know Sunday morning studies, only to find out that you're not even saved. You want to make sure that you yourself have made a commitment. You've surrendered your life to the Lord. And I'm going to lead you in a real simple prayer to do that. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much.